Sure. We'll have a lot more of this walk. We think, however, you've heard enough of it now to get the flavor of it. It'll be like that very much for about the next four hours. And we'll be with it all the way. And we'll be back with it after this message from Gulf. Just their first uh, main stop on this long uh, geology traverse, which will take them right up to the rim of Cone Crater. Let's listen now to the uh, moon to ground conversation. This is the picture that we're going to be seeing for uh, the second TDS uh, serial number. Well, he's, he's giving some serial numbers here, so I'll just go ahead. Uh, this is the picture that we'll be seeing for quite some time. It is not uh, perhaps very instructive uh, for you. So uh, we're going to, uh, we have Jules Bergman now at our own relief map here at our space headquarters. And uh, he'll explain to you now just uh, where the astronauts are going on the surface of the moon, and you'll have a better idea then of uh, what all this conversation means and uh, perhaps be able to uh, to locate them. Okay, Joel, so you set uh, there at station A right now. Could show us what where, where they actually are and what they're doing at this moment. <coughs> it would look something like this. This 8x12 visual relief simulation map made by the space agency with the help of geologists shows the entire Frau Maro site landing area. Beginning with the placement here, of Antares, the lunar module, after it came in and landed, came in over triplet, and landed here between triplet and doublet. And of course, they worked out here yesterday on EVA-1 uh, as they deployed the ALSEP lunar scientific experiment package, that package they have to go back to to align the antenna at the end of the second moonwalk three or four hours from now. Now, if uh, our camera, manned by faithful Joe Shea, will pan with us here, We'll return to the lunar module and show you what they've done. After they unloaded, the camera, by the way, is sitting right here. Can you see that, Ed? And it's pointing up sun, up this way, along this line we've drawn. Cone crater is up here. Let's pull back if we can. One kilometer, a little more than uh, 4,000 feet, actually a little less than 4,000 feet, 4,500 feet as they do the walk away from the lunar module. They are now headed toward Station A, if you will, which goes out at an angle like this, 1,300 feet away from the Antares lunar module. At Station A, they deploy the lunar portable magnetometer. Uh, they'll drill out core tubes uh, to a, a depth of several feet, if they can, retrieving samples of the lunar soil to help geologists and scientists determine the age of that soil. Then they'll progress on to Station B, which is around 800 feet away from Station A, all the time, of course, working their way up a gentle slope toward Cone Crater further up here. After Station B, they move along a line like this, another 1,500 feet, and then begin to work their way up Cone 
to the left of flank crater, which is in here, and then they'll reach the rim of cone, right up here, where you can see those boulders that our lunar orbiter satellite filmed some years ago, those boulders the size of automobiles that Mitchell will attempt to pitch over the edge down into the bottom of cone like that, while Shepard photographs it and gets the tracks of them going through and seismometers listen to them. The pictures of those boulders should indeed be fascinating. Then they'll work their way around the edge of cone, around the rim of here, down, taking more samples as they go, down to flank crater again, over here. Station D, Station D is the way they refer to flank. Uh, taking more samples at Station D, back down toward outpost crater over here, which is uh, just beyond, which is Station E. And again, they'll deploy the lunar portable magnetometer for more readings, do more core tubing work, dig a deep trench at uh, Mitchell's expected to dig while Shepard photographs it. And then they'll gradually start working their way back toward the limb, stopping here at Station F for a triple core sample, uh, more photographs, and more set documented samples <coughs> before heading around here, around the edge of Triplet. They'll skirt inside these, this rim between Triplet's crater, cr craters one, two, and three, if you will. They'll skirt this rim, coming back in for more samples. Mitchell will work down around here, Shepard around here, and then both men will end up back at the lunar module some three hours from now if they hew to the timeline the way they're supposed to. What what will emerge out of all this, uh, out of this historic traverse, this lunar geological expedition, while well, standing by in our Houston studios at the Space Center is Dr. Jack McCauley of the U.S. Uh, Geology Survey's Astrogeological Center in Flagstaff. Jack, yes. what kind of knowledge will we get uh, out of this traverse? Well, this, this is uh, very, very clearly the, um, the longest and best uh, of this sort of uh, thing that we've done so far. And uh, what we hope to do is to um, get samples, as we indicated yesterday, that came from deep within the Imbrium Basin. And uh, this will uh, allow us to say something about the, um, the early history of the moon, the interior of the moon, and um, also something about basin formation itself. This is uh, uh, something that we uh, uh, still don't know a great deal about, and uh, we don't know the nature of the material thrown out to these distances. And uh, we, uh, we hope that uh, from this very, very excellent traverse uh, that we'll get uh, this kind of information. Dr. McCauley, this is Frank Reynolds in New York. Uh, I believe it was uh, Ed Mitchell mentioned the, uh, the raindrop-like effect uh, spattering the surface there as they move out to uh, Station A. Well, how do you uh, interpret that? What, what does that mean to us, really? You know, the rocks scattered over the surface there. Right. I didn't uh, hear you too well uh, on that. I think I know what you're talking about. This is uh, glassy material that uh, apparently was produced by impact and uh, splashed out on the surface of these rocks. Cone crater has uh, been fairly well established uh, is the result of an impact, right? Uh, the result of a substantial body hitting it? Right, it's it not has volcanic. all the characteristics of an impact crater. It's not volcanic. But probably not. It uh, uh, has a sharp rim. The floor is well below the level of the surrounding terrain. Uh, they're very coarse blocks thrown oh, several crater diameters. These are all the kinds of things that are associated with impact craters. And some of these uh, rocks that they're beginning to see, uh, I think they mentioned, uh, or they were questioned about whether they form a uh, pattern. I suppose when they get to the top of the ridge, they'll be able to see whether uh, they are actually positioned in a sort of ray-like effect uh, to show that they did come from Cone Crater. Is that what they're looking for? Well, yes. Actually, if you look at the edge of the uh, crater, as you can see it on the screen right yes. now, you can see <clears throat> what appears to be a plume of rocks extending from right to left across the near rim. And uh, this is one of the things they'll uh, probably comment upon. Frank, if uh, Dr. McCauley can work with me, I'd like to kind of do a 
a visual relief sighting showing the terrain they're climbing and going into the, the actual hike it is. Can we move camera three in here a little bit over my shoulder to show a cutaway, if you will, of this terrain and uh, the slope that they're going through as they uh, climb up, Jack, as we've discussed from triplet to weird to flank to the other craters. In other words, can camera three come in real close here to show this terrain increase? What kind of height increase are we talking about, Jack, that they're walking through? Uh, they'll be going up a total height of about uh, 400 meters. I mean, 400 feet. Uh, the, um, the crater itself is about 200 feet deep. Should that be any problem for them, that kind of climb, uh, with the load they're carrying? No, I don't think so. In the lunar environment, they really get a bonus, so to speak, and it's... Uh, in spite of the bulky suits and all the other things, they can move right along. <laughs> what, as they work along the top of Cone, Jack, I know you've taken exception to uh, the term uh, some reporters have used, unfortunately, including me, that it was dust they were encountering. Will they find loose soil up here on the rim of Cone, or what do you expect? Yes, actually, there'll be some fine material mixed with the blocks. And uh, the uh, uh, material will be mostly the debris thrown out from the crater itself. It'll be poorly sorted. What about their footing? Are they likely to slip? Is there any chance of falling into cone, which seems to have a lot of people worried? Well, I think that uh, they ought to be fairly careful up there. The uh, uh, lip of this could be quite unstable and uh, there may be places where the surface may be quite soft. So I think they'll probably move along uh, rather gingerly. Now, Jack, what is Cone? How did it get there? We've discussed this before. Uh, what, or what event formed Cone how long ago? Oh, well, Cone, is, according to our best estimates, is a fairly young crater. It's uh, what we call a Copernican crater. It happened in the last part of lunar history, and it's superposed on this debris blanket that uh, we've been talking about. So those blocks are part of the underlying debris. These, they, blocks, and, these blocks here that were cast out by the impact of some, uh, some large meteorite. That's right. You say a fairly young crater, but young uh, is a term uh, to be used with uh, uh, how shall I express it? Uh, discretion. Discretion is an excellent <laughs> term. Uh, four million years, five million years, how, wh what does young mean? Well, these are some of the answers that we may get from this expedition. The um, age of these very young craters hasn't been too well documented. And uh, it's possible that uh, by sampling here, uh, getting the uh, so-called exposure ages, that we may be able to uh, date this event. And that will be very important because it will, it will add to the uh, zeroing in on a time scale. Frank? Dr. McCauley, is this process still continuing? I mean, are, are craters, you know, still uh, occurring? Yes. Uh, they are hitting the moon intermittently. The um, uh, the process is occurring even on Earth. If you go out on a warm summer evening sometime, you'll see so-called falling stars. These are little micrometeorite fragments that are falling in. Jack, to return to Cone Crater here for a second, if the cameras can pick it up again, how large a thing are we talking about? By my measurements, it's about a thousand feet across from rim to rim, and what have you figured? 250 feet deep down to the bottom of the crater floor? Yes, 250 feet, right, that's the estimate. That was a fairly sizable uh, geological event uh, that formed that uh, cone then. <clears throat> As events right. go in the this history is, of the moon. Uh, about the size of some of the biggest craters produced on Earth. Uh, there are some craters that have been formed by nuclear explosives. And uh, this is in about that size, that size range. Uh, artificially produced crater, that's what I'm trying to say. Right. This it, is not a, a terribly large crater, though, is it, uh, Dr. McCauley, in terms oh, no. of others on the moon? No. By lunar standards, this is quite small. Yeah. It's what a mediocre crater, Frank, I think uh, Dr. <laughs> McCauley would say. 
or a fair to middling crater. Jack, you raised this point, and Frank did too, of these events continuing. I don't know how many, how many meteorite strikes you figure hit the moon each day and create new craters. But one question that's occurred uh, even to me as well as to millions of other people, I think, is 